Greetings, everybody. Uh, we wanted to review some of the field alert processes that we have in uh, District 13. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, STEMI and stroke, and then um, hopefully in about another month, we'll uh, review uh, sepsis and uh, trauma as well. So uh, let's start with STEMI. So uh, District 13 currently operates out of a PCI Zone 2 area, uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center being our closest uh, cath lab. Um, you can see at the bottom of the uh, screen there, uh, both uh, Brattleboro and uh, Grace Cottage and where we kind of live uh, in this zone. Um, the goals for EMS is basically a, uh, if we're going directly to the cath lab, a recognition um, of a STEMI to reperfusion in the cath lab of, uh, of uh, less than 90 minutes. Um, we've looked at this data, we've met with both Dartmouth, uh, Grace Cottage, uh, Brattleboro and Rescue Inc. and determined that we cannot uh, consistently meet uh, the 90-minute recognition to reperfusion window. Um, so we developed uh, this process, what we call a, a drip and ship model. Uh, so this is uh, basically um, the model we use. Uh, we uh, identify a STEMI in the field, um, rapidly transport the patient to the closest ER, be they, uh, typically it'll be grad uh, Brattleboro or Grace Cottage. Um, they'll receive lytics uh, if they're eligible at that hospital, and then we have rapid uh, transport by our air medical transport if they're available um, to the closest cath lab. Um, and EMS is an extremely important piece of this because uh, once we identify that STEMI, that'll uh, get the process rolling and um, uh, mobilize uh, air medical transport and notify the closest hospital um, to um, uh, get patients to where they need to be um, quickest. Uh, this is definitely a time is uh, muscle sort of scenario. So part of the assessment tre treatment of this, one of our benchmarks, we want to get a 12 lead EKG within 10 minutes of anybody we suspect has acute coronary syndrome. Um, I really advocate getting um, EKGs as part of your vital signs. Um, it's ink on paper. It's not invasive. Um, it's hard to order too many 12 lead EKGs. Um, it's just a, a simple, effective test. And remember that you don't have to be a paramedic to acquire um, a 12 lead EKG. Uh, paramedics can uh, interpret the EKG, but the machines are, are the software is pretty good at identifying um, patients with acute MI suspected. So if you're um, the EMT or advanced EMT level and you acquire a 12 lead EKG, um, it's a clean tracing and says acute MI suspected, um, that's enough to activate the STEMI pathway for our patients. Um, don't forget about aspirin for these patients. Aspirin is one of the few drugs we give and the only pre-hospital drug in acute coronary syndrome that uh, reduces mortality. There's some evidence that the earlier you give um, aspirin, that better uh, off patients are. And remember that the only absolute contraindication to giving aspirin um, to these patients is a history of a previous anaphylactic reaction to, um, to aspirin. So some patients may say, I'm on Coumadin, I can't take aspirin, I have a history of a peptic ulcer, I can't take aspirin. Those are all relative contraindications. Uh, for baby aspirin is uh, generally just fine to take. Confusion also comes up with aspirin, um, where a patient may have taken their daily dose of aspirin in the morning or um, uh, you know, maybe an hour or two before they call DMS. It's okay to give them the four uh, baby aspirin. Um, a lot of these patients develop aspirin resistance and um, it, that additional dosage is not um, gonna be high enough to harm them. And basically just so do your other interventions uh, per Vermont uh, Q coronary syndrome uh, protocol. So what qualifies as STEMI? Um, so if you're an EMT or an advanced EMT, you do a 12 lead EKG, you have a clean tracing and the automated reader says acute MI, um, that'll activate the STEMI pathway. If you're the paramedic and you get a 12 lead EKG and it's showing ST elevation in um, at least one millimeter and two or more contiguous leads, um, that again is um, an activation of the STEMI pathway. What does this process look like? Um, when you identify a STEMI, you wanna activate, make sure DART is activated. Um, and a STEMI alert is notified to dispatch and confirm um, the LZ to the closest hospital that you're transporting to. So it would either be at uh, Brattleboro Memorial Hospital or Onion Field uh, for Grace Cottage. Let them know your uh, ETA, and this request should generally be done through dispatch. You wanna notify the receiving hospital that you have a STEMI alert. And if you don't have a ground paramedic um, on the call, please uh, request one if one is not um, already dispatched and transport the patient uh, to the ED. Remember that time is definitely muscle. And if you go into the ER, um, work with the ER team, you can consider keeping the patient on the EMS stretcher. Um, this could facilitate rapid transfer, sort of what we call a hot stretcher model. Um, so the patient can get the thrombolytics, get the initial, treat initial treatment in the ER, um, and then uh, get um, rapid transport to air medical transport after they give their, their lytics. So benchmarks again, we want an EKG within 10 minutes. We want to give, make sure patients get aspirin or if they have a contraindication to aspirin, document um, 
um, that in your report. Uh, and the ED metrics, there's an ED door to thrombolytic time within, uh, within 30 minutes is their uh, metric as well. All right, let's talk about stroke. So stroke, sort of like time is muscle for STEMI, time is uh, brain uh, for stroke. Uh, there are two types of stroke that we generally think about. You have a hemorrhagic stroke or bleeding into the brain and an ischemic stroke or blockage of a uh, cerebral vessel. Um, for the sake of our alert process, we're generally talking about ischemic uh, stroke patients. Those are the patients that uh, might be eligible to receive uh, TPA, which is a uh, thrombolytic. So definitive treatments for stroke, uh, there's thrombolytic or TPA. Uh, generally, that's given within a three to four and a half hour window. Uh, most of our local EDs use three hour window. Um, four and a half is not uh, FDA approved, but some systems do use that. And then uh, a newer therapy is mechanical, mechanical uh, thrombectomy. Um, this has a longer window. Generally, people use um, out to about six hours, uh, but it really only applies to specific types of uh, infarcts. Uh, we may develop a process in the future where um, we have ways for EMS to identify patients that are um, eligible for mechanical uh, embolectomy. Unfortunately, there is no um, uh, system in place or uh, easy way to identify these patients in the field. Um, it generally takes advanced imaging and discussion with a stroke neurologist on which patients uh, qualify for this uh, treatment. So signs and symptoms of strokes are, are, are really good to review. Um, weakness. Numbness and the weakness is usually going to be and numbness usually going to be unilateral on one side of the body. Changes in vision, dizziness, balance and coordination difficulties, um, altered mental status or difficulty understanding speech, uh, or maybe difficulty where they understand you or they have an expressive aphasia where they can't um, say what they want to say. Some speech difficulty. All these should be considered uh, stroke-like symptoms and um, key you in to do a, a stroke scale. So part of the assessment and treatment, what we really want to know is the time last known well. Um, if the patient goes to bed at 8 o'clock at night and they're found at 6 o'clock in the morning uh, with stroke-like symptoms when they wake up, the time last known well would be, um, would be the night before. Uh, so you really want to identify this time last known well. And um, we're going to be using, we were using three hours as time last known well for a stroke alert. Uh, Vermont protocols talk about six hours and we're going to be using six hours in our system. Uh, the reason we're going to do six hours is to account for those patients who may qualify for mechanical thrombectomy. So you want to document a time last known well, and then you want to do a Cincinnati stroke scale. You want to get a blood glucose level um, because uh, some stroke like uh, hypoglycemic can at time mimic uh, stroke like symptoms. A 12 lead EKG is important, especially uh, to identify arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation that may have um, led to the stroke. And you want to try to get IV access. Um, all of this is uh, time is brain, so you don't want to delay transport for IV access or 12 lead EKG or blood glucose. Those can all be done uh, while en route to the hospital. So if their patient has time last known well, less than six hours, and they have a positive stroke scale, um, this qualifies for a stroke alert. Uh, we use the Cincinnati stroke scale um, in our system here. Uh, you can look for facial droop, arm drift, or abnormal normal speech. And if any one of these three signs is abnormal, the probability of a stroke is 72%. Um, so keep stroke on the brain, especially for those patients with like weakness or altered mental status. Um, definitely try to do your stroke scales because sometimes these are kind of hard to uh, tease out. Uh, this is just the stroke scale that the Vermont, um, e in the Vermont EMS protocols and their screening tool here. Um, you can fill this out. This is helpful information to have at the hospital. Um, again, they talk at time last known well. It's also, if you have a witness or a family member to transport with you in the ambulance, this is very important because we often use um, witnesses or family members to gather more information to kind of um, uh, tease out when exactly the stroke may have occurred um, or try to get that best contact number for that witness. And then you want to uh, talk about the symptoms they have, weakness, confusion, difficulty speaking, understanding, numbness, um, uh, severe headache, et cetera. And then do your Cincinnati stroke scale and, um, and follow your stroke alert criteria in six, we use six hours. So the process, if you have a stroke alert, you want to notify the closest hospital immediately of a stroke alert. Um, these patients can be transported to the closest hospital. There is no role for air medical transport in our system for uh, stroke alerts um, because of many of these patients um, will get uh, TPA as the uh, therapy. Um, you want to transport uh, the patient to the ER for a rapid assessment and workup for possible thrombolytics. And um, this ED assessment will include a CAT scan. The CAT scan is generally done not to identify a stroke itself, 
um, but to make sure there's not an intracranial bleed, um, and that would be a contraindication to um, getting TPA. They'll also do uh, labs and um, screen for additional TPA eligibility, um, and they might also screen to see who's a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy. The benchmarks, uh, again, time last known well, very, very important. You want to use less than six hours. We want to document this. Do your stroke scale, blood glucose. And once that patient reaches the ER, there's generally an ED door to thrombolytics within 60 minutes. There'll be an ED benchmark for this. Uh, that's all we have uh, for today. Uh, if you guys have any uh, questions, just email me. Um, I'm uh, very easy to get a hold of, and uh, we'll hopefully have more to come. Thank you.